things that are going on with uh, MCAS. Uh, first of all, welcome to uh, another virtual Zoom meeting of the Mendocino Coastal Audubon Society. Uh, big thanks to Nikki uh, for setting up the Zoom meeting and uh, to Tara and Haley for setting up the program that we're going to enjoy tonight. Uh, we've restarted a few of our activities for Mendocino Coast Audubon uh, in a kind of a limited way, doing as much as we can under the circumstances. And uh, we have just recently restarted the beginner's bird walks at the Mendocino Coast Botanical Gardens. And I believe David uh, led that and Nikki and Haley joined him on the first Saturday of November. And uh, he reported that it worked out pretty well. And so we'll do that again in December and uh, carry on as much as we can with the limitations imposed by the, the pandemic and the uh, gardens limits on how many people can go in at once and that sort of thing. But basically uh, we're starting at 9 a.m. on the first Saturday of each month. We've also started the intermediate level uh, bird walks, the early bird walks on the third Wednesday of each month. So that's coming right up. Uh, and that starts now at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, we're going to the winter hours on that walk because there's less daylight now. We, uh, we are still working on sorting out how we can restart field trips. Uh, normally we would be talking about the Raptor trip right now, but just the logistics of that trip with the carpooling make it extraordinarily difficult. And so we're gonna try and see if we can pull something together for December. Uh, there haven't really been all that many Raptors down there yet anyway, because it's such a dry fall. Uh, I've gone down there and birded a couple of times just to scout it out. And uh, uh, there's not a lot happening down the south coast right now because it's been so dry. Uh, hopefully that will change now that the rain seems to have come and we've got more rain coming up and that should improve the conditions down on the south coast uh, for the raptors. Um, normally I like to ask at the meetings if anybody has seen any good birds lately. Uh, if you have anything to contribute, you can use the chat function and uh, we can relay that around. That's how, by the way, we will do the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you have questions pretty much at any time, you can uh, write them out in the chat. If you send them to me or to everyone, but especially to me, then I will relay them to Dr. Fogarty at the end of the presentation and then he'll have a chance to answer everyone's questions. Uh, the other thing that we have restarted or are going to do. We, uh, the board of directors had uh, a discussion and David and I talked it out and decided that we are going to do a Christmas, the Christmas bird counts this year uh, to the extent that we can do them. They will be a little different uh, as you might understand. Uh, first of all, there will be no count dinners, uh, which is a terrible shame. One of the highlights of a Christmas bird count is that tally dinner but we just, there's no feasible, safe way to do it. So we will be counting birds, uh, but we will be doing a lot less public outreach. Uh, we're not gonna try to recruit a lot of people because we won't really have the ability to assemble teams to go out in the field. Uh, it's, it would be a lot more work on the team leaders this year to try to figure out ways to do that. But the team leaders uh, are going out and we'll just break up into small individual groups in bird patches. And we're really going to emphasize the yard and feeder counts this year uh, because one, it's great birding and there's a lot of really good birds that show up in people's yards. And two, it's a great safe way to participate. Uh, and then we can still get a lot of people involved. So uh, we will have more information about that in the December newsletter. Uh, and uh, that, of course, will also be the subject of our December presentation, which will be David and I doing our review of winter birding on the Mendocino coast and, uh, and how you can participate in the Christmas bird counts. If you want to mark your calendars, the Fort Bragg count is uh, Sunday, December 27th, and the Manchester count is Saturday, 
January 2nd of 2021. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm really looking forward to January 1 of 2021. Anything to get this year behind me. I see someone uh, does have a report of a golden eagle at Leonard Lake. Now, where is Leonard Lake? That's what I want to know. Uh, that doesn't ring any bells to me. But a golden eagle anywhere on the coast is a good find. I would say I found, uh, we did find the first ferruginous hawk that I've seen this fall down at the, the uh, Ross Ranch, uh, down there just between Manchester and Point Arena. Uh, it was distant, but unmistakable. And the other good bird we found the other day was a Eurasian, a Drake Eurasian widgeon uh, with a small flock of American widgeon at the mouth of the Garcia River, which was very birdy. And there is a lone and presumably lonely sandhill crane that has been down there, I think, almost two months now. Uh, that bird has been reported pretty regularly over the last several weeks. And it's still down there all by itself. One Sandhill Crane. So I think that's about all I have to say uh, about what we're up to lately. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, uh, you, you've got rough legs up there in uh, Arcata. Well, send yeah, send us a couple. Those are great birds. Be a, we had one last year that camped out up north of town, up by the Newport in uh, the inn at Newport Beach that and it just stayed there it was a very obliging bird uh, and that was the first time for us as far as I know since I've been here we've only very very rarely had rough-legged hawks and they they never stay around they just pass through so it was pretty cool having one stay around for the winter so we'll go back and look for that bird because as you know raptors have a lot of sight fidelity and they tend to go back to the same spots every winter. With that, I think it is time to introduce our guest. Uh, and we now have 30 participants. So welcome to all of you who managed to figure out how to find this meeting while I was talking, even though I had sent out apparently a, uh, a bogus link. But my attempt at misdirection failed and you found us anyway. Uh, welcome to our guest tonight, Dr. Frank Fogarty who is with the Humboldt State University Department of Wildlife. Uh, he's a lecturer there, and uh, he does research at Audubon's Bobcat Ranch, and uh, in particular was involved doing work there, what, from 2016 and 2018, during a time period when they had a, six, a series of wildfires pass through the ranch. And of course, that's much on everyone's mind this year, and I believe you had yet another fire pass through that area this year as well, which would be what, I think six fires in seven years. It's uh, been pretty nearly an annual event now. So uh, it's a subject uh, that a lot of people are interested in. So uh, we're all looking forward to hearing your discussion of how that affects the habitat and birds and the relationship to cattle grazing. So everyone, please welcome Dr. Frank Fogarty. Great, thank you, Tim. Give me a moment here and I can get my PowerPoint up and going. Your, your question there made me think I need to go back and check. I think we might be at seven fires in seven years now on the ranch. It's, it's definitely at least six. Um, so we've had, we've had a lot lately down there. So this is just gonna be a little, a little snapshot of the period of time and, and the fires that we've had. Uh, can you all see that, the share screen okay? Can they give me a thumbs up or? Cool, great. So as, as Tim mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about the potential effects of wildfire and also of cattle grazing on wintering bird communities in this area of Northern California that uh, is owned by Audubon California. This is a picture of, of Bobcat Ranch. And I'll talk a little bit more about the, the ranch in particular and, and what the landscape looks like there as, as I move on with the talk. So I mentioned this idea of how does, how does wildfire, how do cattle affect birds? So we often think of both of those things as, as being potential disturbances for birds. They're certainly both uh, 
drivers that could impact birds in some way and, and alter the, the habitat. So we were interested in, in what's going on with when those two things are occurring, either simultaneously or separate on, on the landscape, and how they can affect a few different aspects of, of birds in the winter. Uh, so first, we, we wanted to know just how they affect species richness, and that's just how many species are present. So if you look at areas that have burned versus areas that haven't burned, or areas that have active cattle grazing or don't have active cattle grazing, are there differences in the number of bird species in total that are present between those areas? But that's not the, the whole picture when you're thinking about the community of birds that's present at a, at a given site. We can also think about who's there. So the, the composition of the community. Even if two areas both have 20 species of birds, they could, those 20 species can be a lot different. So we're also interested in, are there differences in the, in the composition of the community? You can think of it as the roster of what species are present. Again, comparing these burned, unburned, grazed, ungrazed areas. And then our last question was, even if all those things are equal, same number of species, same species present between the two sites, you could have changes in the abundance of birds that are present at these sites. So you could have fewer birds in areas with cattle grazing and more with fire. So looking at how the, the actual raw number of individuals present could be affected by these factors. So those were our three main questions. And then I mentioned on my title slide that we were looking at wintering bird habitat. You might be wondering why we, we uh, zeroed in on winter. We don't really have fires knock on wood yet in the, in the winter very much. So this is outside of the fire season. We're looking at the first growing season, potentially after fires. So why wintering bird habitat? I, I think our primary reason for, for doing this was that it's really understudied when it comes to birds. My, my hunch is that if you went and did a, a literature search and tried to look at scientific journals for this, you'd see somewhere around 20 or 30 to one breeding season versus wintering season. People just study wintering birds a lot less than they study breeding season birds. Because part of that is maybe in the breeding season, there's more, there might be some interesting things that don't happen in winter. So you have all that breeding activity. You can study that. Birds are easier to study in the summer as well. They, they have more adherence to a, to a territory and they don't move around as much. And that makes certain types of work easier. In the winter, they may be wandering around more and making things more difficult. But nevertheless, it's an important part of the, the natural history of, of these birds and understanding what's going on with them in winter. And then to add on to that, even when we have non-migratory species, they still are probably using different resources, even if they're not moving where they are between the summer and the winter. So we can't just look at what's going on in the summer and then even for a non-migratory species, think we understand what's happening with them in winter. So it's really obvious if you've got a bird that breeds in British Columbia and winters in Mexico, obviously it's using different resources in Mexico than in British Columbia because it's in a totally different place. But something like this Western Meadowlark that potentially might only travel a few hundred meters between where it was breeding in the summer to where it's hanging out in the winter, really not moving around all that much at all, it's still almost certainly using different resources. So the the uh, plant resources that are available, what's, what's greened up, what seeds might be present for it to eat, certainly the insect communities that are around that it could forage on, all those things are likely going to change throughout the year between these different seasons. So there could be different stresses on your population occurring in the winter than in the summer, even staying in the exact same place. So that was one of the reasons that we were, that we really wanted to look at this. Um, also, we're working on the edge of the, the Central Valley. It's much more pleasant to work in the winter there than it is in the, in the summer, temperature-wise. I mean, it rains a little bit, but at least it's not 110 degrees when you're out there doing field work. And then as I briefly mentioned at the beginning, and, and Tim mentioned this in his introduction, uh, this work was all done at a property called Bobcat Ranch. This is owned by Audubon California, and they've owned it for a little bit more than a decade now. I, still kind of think of it as a newer property that Audubon California owns, but it's getting on there now. Uh, it's a decent size, about 6,800 acres. This is a, uh, a photo of one of the, the canyons that we worked in there, and I think this is pretty characteristic of the landscape there. Uh, quite steep topography, these um, open wooded hills, it's mostly blue oak woodland. I would say something like 99% of the trees on the property are blue oaks. It's, it's by far the most numerous tree species, although there's some other stuff mixed in. 
And then in some places you get even larger open grassy patches that you might even consider to be something like savanna where the, the oak trees are really scattered. There's a little bit of chaparral up high on some of the, the very high ridges. I'll talk a little bit about that in, in some of the chaparral birds that we encountered later on. Uh, and some riparian areas as well. As you get down into some of the very steep drainages, you get a little bit of riparian vegetation where there's either permanent stream flows or more often there's just subsurface water there. But the vast majority of what we were looking at looks like about what you see here. And if you're not familiar with uh, Bobcat Ranch, this yellow circle here is, is roughly where it is. I didn't actually bother to, to draw out the actual um, outline here. I have another map I'll show you that's zoomed in in a few minutes, but that's roughly where it is. So I was um, taking this from Davis. It's about straight west of Sacramento. As soon as you get to um, the, the foothills starting up there, I think it gets down to about 150 feet elevation and then gets up to somewhere around 1700 feet. So getting up into those first few ridge lines in the intercoast range there. I'm not sure why when I did this map that um, they put a red question mark on the refuge manager Dash's house. I'm still not sure if I should warn him that Google is, is doing that to his house there, but that's what that represents. So that's where we go in and then from there we're, we're hiking up into the, um, into the steeper country. And of course, got to talk a bit about fire. So these, this is a, a system that is very fire adapted. We, we know that it, that it naturally um, has fire. It's had fire for a long time. The, the plant and animal species there are in some ways adapted to, to living with fire and to even depending on fire to, to help them propagate and to help clear out underbrush. And in particular, the, the fires that we were looking at for this work were relatively low severity, low to maybe low moderate severity. That's, I would say, relatively typical for these kind of open oak savanna systems, especially when they have relatively frequent fire. And this is an area that has been experiencing quite frequent fire over the last 10 to 15 years. And so these fires tend to stay relatively low severity. And when that happens, the, the mortality of these blue oaks, which are the dominant species there, is really low. It's definitely far below 1%. So this is a, a photo of one of the hillsides where we were working in Bobcat. I think this was taken about two months after one of the fires. And you can see there's still trees everywhere. Um, a lot of their leaves have, have crisps up and browned and, and died from the heat of the fire, but most of those trees are going to survive that you see there. There might be uh, one or two on, on the hillside that did burn up in the fire, but these fires don't dramatically turn it into a moonscape and wipe out all the trees. Most of those trees survive. However, it is different for some of the more scarce tree species that we see on the landscape. Gray pines are probably about the second most numerous tree at Bobcat they do suffer from higher mortality. I, th I think the majority of them still do survive these fires, but a substantial number of them do burn. And a lot of the other um, tree species uh, suffer very high mortality in these fires. Things like toyon, um, buckeye, they, when the fire comes through, it's 90, 95% of them get burned up. So we do see some of the more scarce tree species on the landscape, certainly the woody shrubs, all getting burned up in these fires, but these dominant blue oaks are able to survive. And then we get some mixed effects on what's going on on the actual ground. Um, in many cases, it burns everything, all the litter in the grass. In some cases on the steeper hillside, some of that survives. And then immediately after the fire, you get uh, a lot of neat variation coming in where that landscape is just burned out. You've got all that um, carbon from the fire and all the nutrients sitting on the spare soil and you get a lot of diversity coming in, in terms of herbaceous vegetation, not just this thick invasive grass. So it actually, it's, it's pretty interesting to get out there and look at the vegetation immediately after these fires. And we've had several recent fires at Bobcat. Uh, we started our work in the winter of 2016, 2017, and this was in part inspired by the fact that the cold fire had happened there. So uh, a, colleague and a, a colleague and I, decided, hey, this fire happened. It burned part of the ranch. We've been doing a little bit of other stuff out there. Let's go and compare these unburned and burned areas. It's sort of a, a natural experiment there. Um, unbeknownst to us, uh, it would go on to burn again the following summer after we had wrapped up that first year of data collection in a different pattern than it had the, the previous winter. And so that impacted how we did our data collection the next year. So we did this across, across two winters, um, after the cold fire, after the winter fire. 
It proceeded to then burn again in, in June of 2018 with the county fire. Um, I believe there was a fire that, that got onto part of the property in 2019. And in 2020, we had an absolutely enormous fire that burned a lot of the property again. If you go back before we started working, both 2014 and 2015 had parts of the property burning as well. This is not an enormous property, less than 7,000 acres. So this is a lot of fire happening. Uh, things are changing. The, the climate getting, getting warmer and more arid is allowing these fires to carry. Property is also very close to some uh, ignition sources with a highway and power lines nearby that make it especially susceptible. And our best estimate of, of the historic fire frequency is probably somewhere around 30 to 50 years. So again, it's a fire adapted system. Fire was very much a part of the, of the history of this landscape. You get, we think any given site probably burns somewhere between every 30 to 50 years. Uh, you don't have to really do much math here to see that that fire interval, that return interval has gotten a lot smaller. And in some cases, individual sites are burning like every other year or something like that now, at least over the last 10 years. And here's a zoomed in uh, image showing the, the Bobcat property and some of the recent fires. So this green outline that you can see here, it's a little hard to see, but this, this kind of faint green box here, that's the actual boundary of, of Bobcat. This is Highway 128 here. And then these yellow colors are how many fires have occurred uh, over this period this map is for, which is just 2014 to 2017. So this pale yellow, these are all places that burned once in that time period. This orange, all this area burned twice in those four years. And this red kind of in the center of the property burned three of those four years. And again, we continued to see this in, in 2018. We had another fire that burned a substantial portion of the ranch, a very substantial portion burning again in 2020. If we were to make this add the next three years on this map, we'd probably have some sites that have burned um, at least four or five years out of that, that range. So really frequent fire occurring. And as mentioned, uh, we did this in 2016-17 in and then 17-18 the following winter. We, we set out to do point counts between these sites. So we set up sites that were all four combinations. So areas that were actively being grazed and had just burned the previous year, areas that were actively being grazed but hadn't burned the previous year, and then ungrazed sites that were burned and unburned. So when we were calling sites burned, uh, you can't find anywhere on this property that hasn't burned sometime in the last 10 years. It's, it's virtually impossible. Maybe in the bottom of a really steep ditch, you might have a little five foot strip or something like that. But we see that the first growing season after a fire is when the vegetation looks really different. Even just one year removed from a fire, it's really even hard to tell that a fire came through. Certainly by two years out, the, the invasive grasses are in a lot more thick again. There's this kind of knotted thatch of, of dead grass. And we don't think there's a lot of differences between areas that, that haven't burned in five years or 10 years versus haven't burned in two or three years. So we considered burn sites. There was just a fire a few months ago, and this is the first growing season after that. So we went out and did these, these point counts at a, at a bunch of sites that we set up. We, we ended up doing about 48 points in total. And then we sort of lucked out in that some of our um, sites from the first year that we worked out there flipped treatments uh, between years. And what I mean by flipped is most of our sites that weren't, that were unburned in the first winter went on to burn the next year and then vice versa. Um, in fact, to the point where it looked a little suspicious, I, I promise we did not actually set these fires despite the fact that um, this worked out really well for our experimental design. Uh, so here, this is just a, a zoomed in map of, of the study points we were working at just to illustrate what I mean about them flipping. So these red points here were the ones that were, um, that had burned in our first, prior to our first year of data collection. And then this blue area was the unburned section that we surveyed the first year. And then when we came back in 2017, 2018, um, this section down here below the, the headquarters, it was previously unburned, it burned. So we flipped treatments for that. And then um, Break Canyon over here, it had burned uh, two years prior, but now we were treating it as unburned in our second year of data collection. And then we added some more higher elevation sites as a set of burned and unburned. And then these were all, I didn't show it here, all of these sites were, were roughly split 50-50 between grazed and ungrazed. So we're looking at all four combinations of those factors there to see whether when you have combinations of grazing and fire, if there are differences. Okay, so this is supposed to be a talk about birds. 
I'm now actually going to talk about birds instead of just talking about, about bobcat and about fire and about plants. Uh, so we detected a fair amount of species out there. This is a relatively um, dry property. It, it's, there's almost no, there might be one or two little perennial ponds that are stock ponds for cattle, but they're um, typically in most years, unless it's a relatively wet year, there's really no perennial running streams, not a lot of water, very minimal um, riparian, almost no marsh vegetation. So not an especially diverse area. We still detected 70 species during the winter um, across these two years. And then 57 of those we actually picked up during our point count surveys. The, that's pretty typical, that discrepancy there. The remainder, uh, we're pretty close to Lake Berryessa. So we get things like Canada goose, ducks flying overhead, not using the habitat. We'd write them down, but they don't count our point counts. And then sometimes you just run into rare species that are, are really hard to pick up on a point count. You flush an owl or something like that while you're walking, but you're never gonna pick it up on a point count. But we still got 57 species in our, in our data set. We look a little bit closer at those 57 species. Uh, 14 of them are really common. These are kind of our core species that were present on the ranch. So more than half of our points had those 14 species. And then at the opposite end of the spectrum, and we had 11 species that we only detected at, a, at one point. So out of all those 48 points, which ended up being 60 something surveys in total because they were surveyed across multiple years, across, across both years, some of those points, uh, 11 species detected at only, only one time there. And that's pretty typical for this type of work. So what I'm showing here on the, on the y-axis, the vertical here, this is the number of points where we detected the bird. Um, it goes up to more than 48 because if we surveyed the point two years, it's counted both times here. And then across the Y, this is all the species that, that we included. And so the taller the bar, the more, more points we found those species. And this kind of very um, rapidly declining curve here is pretty typical when you do this sort of work where you get that cohort of really common species and then it tails off really quickly and you have a lot of more rare species. So oak titmouse was our champion. I think we had one point where we somehow didn't find an oak titmouse, but they're basically ubiquitous out there. And then we've got this, um, this group of those 14 or so species that I mentioned that are really abundant at our sites. Uh, things like Nuttles woodpecker, dark-eyed junco, acorn woodpecker, this is your core group. And as we move down into kind of the less common, but still a dozen or more sites, we get things like bush tits and house finch, spotted towhee, uh, Western bluebird in, in this group. And then we really start to get down to the single digit species. We only got these on one, two, three, four sites. Um, these are things like uh, Northern pig meow, house wren, black phoebe, red-breasted sapsucker. So they're, they're present out there in, in small numbers. They make up an important part of the community, but they're hard to find. It and it takes a lot of surveys to make sure that you, you accounted for them. So that's one of the reasons that we did so many repeated surveys out there. We surveyed each of these sites three times in a given year, did 48 points in total. Because we're trying to capture as much of this tail as we can, we know you, it takes a lot of surveys to actually get out the whole community that's present. Okay, so if you remember back to the beginning, I, I talked about three questions that we had for this work. And the first one was looking at species richness, which is how many species are present at a given site. So Again, we wanted to compare burned versus unburned sites. So does uh, fire in the previous summer affect species richness? Similarly, grazed versus ungrazed sites. So is there active cow grazing at the site or not? Uh, in most cases there, I think any of the sites that we categorized as not being grazed hadn't been grazed in at least a decade, um, at least prior to the, the purchase by Audubon. So, the, the landscape had a, a decent amount of time to recover. In some cases, it may have been decades or even never that they were grazed. And then we also looked at a bunch of other things that I haven't mentioned yet. We measured a lot of different environmental variables that were related to vegetation cover at these sites to see how that might also affect species richness. Um, I'm gonna throw up this long laundry list of them here. I'm not gonna go through all these, but basically we have things like looking at what's on the ground, how much grass cover is there, how much bare ground is there, how much um, oak canopy is there? How many toyons are there? Is there cottonwood on the site? All these different vegetation factors to, to try to understand what was going on. So a couple of the results when we looked at the species richness di differences. So 
first of all, when we looked at unburned sites, our, our average species richness, so the average number of, of species found at a site that hadn't burned the previous year, uh, was 20 species. And then if we look at the average for a burned site, so burned the previous summer, that dropped all the way down to 11.6 species. So you might look at this at first and be like, wow, it's a, a huge difference. Fire seems to be, to be really bad for these birds because we get this, this big net loss of species richness. I think there probably is something to, there's something there. Um, there. There is a difference between these sites and there are fewer birds at the burned sites. But I wanna point out a, a big but here that the vegetation that's present at these sites really mediates this difference. And in some cases you can get these overlapping or even have more species at a burn site depending on what's there vegetation wise. So not, probably not a big surprise. It really does matter what the actual landscape looks like there both before and after the fire in terms of vegetation, in terms of how that affects the species richness. And our other main question was, was grazing here no significant effects. So that was a little bit surprising to us. We did not get a significant difference in the number of species that were present on sites that were actively grazed versus ungrazed. Again, um, looking at both burned and, and unburned there for both of those categories. So I mentioned that um, the vegetation there being really important. So I'm gonna go through a few of our, our results for the vegetation and show how that um, correlated with how many species we had at our sites. So I'll just explain what's going on here with this, this plot first. So on the x-axis here, on the horizontal, this is just the amount of grass. So it's just percentage. So 20% is the, is the minimum we had at any of our sites. There's grass everywhere. You can't get lower than 20% out there. Um, and that's usually gotta be a, a site that was burned to get to that low amount. And then similarly, there's no sites that are 100% grass. So 70% was our maximum. So this was the range that we saw for our sites. And then on the y-axis here, this is our, our predicted amount of species based on our model. So what was the species richness at a site given a certain amount of grass cover? And so the big takeaway here is that as grass cover went up, our, our model predicted a significant increase in the number of species from closer to about 16 species at the low end all the way up to I think about 22 species at the high end. So uh, a pretty dramatic change. It became out of significant model. Grass seemed to be important to more grass to having more species richness. And then one of our biggest effects, um, Quercus is the, the genus of oaks. So this is the amount of, of oak canopy. We tossed around a few different ways to measure this and we decided to, to do a calculation that got at what is the actual mass of foliage in these oak trees. So rather than counting the number of trees out there or, or something else like that, we decided to go with this calculation because this is essentially the, the habitat that birds are using. So the more mass of foliage you have, the more places for birds to be in the canopy. So we, we uh, set out to measure this at each site. We took measurements of the trees that let us calculate this foliage mass. And probably not surprising, our, our minimal sites had no oak trees at all. We did have a few sites that had none, way fewer species. And then as, as foliage max maxed out, we got quite a few more species. This is one of the strongest effects. Birds really seem to like having more canopy, just more potential habitat to, to record more species on these sites. Then a slightly more interesting one here is the amount of bare ground that we found. So, Again, that varied from zero. We did have some sites with no bare ground. Uh, those almost certainly were sites that had not burned recently. And then about the maximum we got on burned sites was, was 50% bare ground. And so what we saw with that is get to about 30% bare ground and the amount of species basically plateaus. So that's about the minimum you need. But as you start to drop below 30% bare ground, you, do, you lose species. And in fact, at very low amounts of bare ground, we saw quite low species richness. And this is one of those factors that probably helps to mediate that difference between burned and, and unburned areas in terms of species richness. So the only way that you can really get these very low amounts of bare ground is if the site hasn't burned recently. So if your site is unburned, but it has almost no bare ground, uh, there's not a lot of uh, heterogeneity on the ground. It's just thick thatch of all grass and, and dead litter down there. That's gonna pull down the number of species that are there. There's just uh, less opportunities for for birds that like to forage and walk on the ground to be able to do that. So having some mix of bare ground and other things seems to maximize the number of bird species you have. Some may like to walk around in that thick, dense grass, like a meadowlark, and, and forage in that. 
other species like morning dove or golden crown sparrow, they're going to want to be able to walk around and actually have their feet on bare soil and pick at it. So the, this mixture of bare ground and, and other things in the ground probably helps. And supporting that is, is looking at the effect of litter. So this is a relatively subtle effect, but it was still significant, where median amounts of litter maximize the, the amount of birds. Uh, this is not like soda cans and things thrown on the ground. What we mean by litter here is uh, debris from, from woody plants. So dead leaves on the ground, twigs, um, dead grass that, that builds up on the ground and tends to build up a lot more um, when there hasn't been fire. So these really um, low litter areas were almost all burned. These really high litter areas were almost all unburned. And then you get some of these intermediate areas where we got the most species. And then the last vegetation effect I'm gonna talk about is the diversity of woody shrubs. Uh, so what we see here is on the x-axis, this is the number of different shrub species that are present in this plot. Um, this is a 100 meter radius plot. So it's about three hectares in area. So we had some plots with no shrub species there. Again, if they had no or one shrub species, they almost certainly had burned recently. That fire just wiped out all the shrubs and none of them had regenerated yet. So down here at the, at the low end, after fire came through and there was almost no shrub diversity, lower amount of birds. And then that more or less plateau here until you get to about four, five, six, seven species of, of woody shrub. And we really started to see a big increase, especially at this, these high diversity sites. So these birds seem to be responding to having a, a good mix of different shrub species present. Those might afford them foraging habitat, um, shelter from predators to hide in, things like that, but really, really strong response here. Again, harder to get that high shrub diversity in a burn site, one of the reasons probably why they had lower species richness. But in some cases, you still do get um, some of those woody shrubs that do survive the fire. And so this is not necessarily a, a black and white, that all fire on the left and, and no fire on the right. Okay, so I've shown you a bunch of different effects that we had there in terms of vegetation. So I wanna just summarize the major things that we found looking at species richness. So first one, birds like trees. Uh, especially oak canopy. This is probably not really much of a surprise to, to anyone. Having more canopy space is just more places for there to be more birds. There's just more niches to fill when you have more canopy mass. So that one wasn't a big surprise that it was a really important effect. Grass seemed to be important to birds, but I think the overall message was making sure that you have a good mix of bare ground, of litter, of grass on the ground to maximize the, the different types of foraging habitat for these different bird species to, to maximize the total species richness at a site. As I mentioned at the beginning, unburned sites tended to have more species than burned sites. With that big asterisk there, other variables matter. You really have to think about the vegetation. And again, no major effect of, of grazing or species richness, on, on species richness. We didn't see a difference in the number of species between grazed and ungrazed areas. Okay, so that was our first question. How does fire, how does cattle grazing affect how many species are present? But again, that's not the whole picture. We also need to think about who's there. So the, the composition of the community. How are the identities of the species present in places with fire, different from without fire, and the same for grazing. And we also went ahead and looked at these same vegetation variables for this as well. Uh, I'm not gonna show you any, any figures like I was uh, in the previous one for this. Um, this uses what we call non-parametric statistics, which makes a lot of people's heads hurt. I'm not gonna, it's a little hard to look at the figures. So I'm just gonna talk through the, the major results here for this community composition analysis. Uh, and we often like to just be confusing as ecologists and call this beta diversity. Beta diversity just refers to how different is the composition between two sites. So how different are the species? Ignoring the count there, just the, the actual identities. So a couple of the biggest differences. First, when we looked at grazed areas and compared them to ungrazed areas, we saw a substantial difference, a significant difference in which species were present. Remember, we didn't get a difference in how many species were present but the identity of those species was significantly different. And when we looked at these grazed areas, these grazed areas also tended to have fewer deciduous tree species, so a lower diversity. They were mostly blue oak and not much else. And then as you moved into those ungrazed areas, 
that had differences in what species were there, we also saw a higher diversity of deciduous trees. So that's where we would get uh, more live oaks and, and buckeyes and um, uh, laurel and toyon mixed in with the, with the blue oak. I'll talk a little bit more about that, about why that is in, in a moment, but we got a big difference there in the composition. And then the other major axis that we got there, so differences between two types of sites, was between burned and unburned. So uh, for the beta diversity question here, we got differences for, for both of our main uh, objectives. So looking at the differences between grazed and ungrazed, and then also burned and unburned. Probably not surprising, we had this strong association of unburned sites having a lot more litter on the ground. If a fire hasn't come through recently, you get a buildup of a lot of, a lot of that woody debris on the ground and dead leaves. And then we also got fewer herbaceous forbs at those unburned sites. So like most of the, the Central Valley and the surrounding foothills, Bobcat Ranch has lots of invasive grasses. They come in really thick once you get a couple years removed from a fire and they start to choke out a lot of the smaller native herbaceous vegetation. So unburned sites, we get fewer of those herbaceous forbs. And then as you move into burned sites, not surprisingly, we get a lot less litter. It's just burned. There hasn't been time to accumulate much. And we get a lot more diversity in what's, what's growing on the ground. So again, a substantial difference between those unburned and burned sites in what species were, were present there. Uh, if we look back at the, um, the top one there for the, the grazed versus ungrazed areas, I think there probably also is some connection there with the diversity of the deciduous tree species. Uh, I don't have the data to support this, but my, my hunch is that in those ungrazed areas, there's more opportunity for those other deciduous tree species to take hold and get up to being adult size and get out of just being saplings anymore. Whereas in the grazed areas, I think those, those cattle are, are grazing a lot of those young trees as they're coming in and they're just saplings and they're having a lot of difficulty getting established in those areas. Uh, uh, this has been documented many times in other places. We don't have the data for it at Bobcat but we have a, a strong hunch that that's what's going on there. These areas that have been historically grazed probably have reduced diversity in their, in their tree composition. And in fact, many of the blue oaks are really old. We, we don't really get blue oak recruitment either in those areas. And the problem is that the fire has wiped out the other deciduous tree species. The blue oak survives the fire and the other species aren't able to, to recolonize with the cattle being there. I saw a question about grass cover there. Um, the difference in grass cover related to the, to the habitat perennial versus annual. We didn't really um, get into, into measuring the specific species of grass that were present at the site, so I'm not really sure um, if, if there was a difference in composition there. We kept this pretty coarse when we were doing those vegetation measurements, and I think there'd be a lot more room to, to, to dig into that. Okay, and I have to get back to the birds and talk a little bit more about those. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the different species that we saw between these sites. So again, grazed versus ungrazed, we had different um, community composition. When we looked at the, the grazed sites, these were some of the, the most characteristic species that were present in grazed areas, but, but rarely present in ungrazed areas. And a lot of these make, make sense to me, especially if you look at these first three species, Western Bluebird, American Kestrel, Loggerhead Shrike. Uh, these are predatory species that are often grabbing prey off of or near the ground and grazed areas probably offer them better foraging. So it's easier to spot small mammals running around in the grass if the cattle have grazed the grass down a little bit lower or um, insects if you're a western bluebird that isn't feeding on mice. So I'm guessing that these species are really honing in on the fact that there's less cover for their prey items in those grazed areas. And then lark sparrow and savanna sparrow are, are two species that do like to walk around the ground. It seems like they do like to forage in shorter grass habitat. And when the, the grass gets really, really dense and high, this invasive grass, you probably just don't get many of them foraging. It's difficult for them to move around. And then as the name implies with rock wren, they love to have open patches of bare ground and rocks. Also easier to get that when you've got some grazing that's opening up areas around those and they don't get as overgrown with grasses. So that was, um, refreshing there, getting this list of species that, okay, this all makes sense. The natural history of these birds makes sense why they're in the grazed areas. And then if we look over to the ungrazed areas and the species that are characteristic there, got things like golden crown sparrow, house wren, bush tit, buick's wren, California towhee. Uh, 
if you're familiar with these species, you know that they like to hang out around dense shrubs. Uh, even if you're the, a golden crown sparrow that forages out on the open ground, they like to, to stick near shrubs so they can duck in for cover if there's a predator or if they get scared. And then other things like bush tit and buick strand will actively be foraging in that, in that dense shrubby vegetation. So this is just probably the case that in areas that, are, that uh, are grazed, we just don't have much of that woody, shrubby, um, dense, low to the ground vegetation for cover. The, the cows have, have removed much of it from those areas. And so we get far less habitat for these species. They seem to be concentrated in ungrazed areas. And then if we look at that other axis of, of burned versus unburned, again, differences in the community composition. This one was a little bit less straightforward. Um, for the burned, I think these, some of these make sense. California quail do like to walk around on, on, and forage on bare ground. We would sometimes see them foraging on, on areas that have been completely scoured by the fire. Rufus crown sparrow likes minimally vegetated steeper slopes. So I think that helps to open up a little bit of, of habitat for them when you have fire. I'll come back to wren tit in a moment because that's a really interesting one um, in terms of what's going on there. Uh, and northern flicker, I think, does make a lot of sense. They often will forage on the ground for ants or termites. After fire, you have more exposed bare ground. And you also end up with big chunks of wood that didn't burn up that are laying on the ground. Those will start to get ants and termites in them and the flickers can forage on them. So that makes sense there. Um, the wren tit, I think, was uh, really interesting what we at least surmise was going on there. So wren tit in our, in our study area are confined to chaparral at high elevations. We didn't do any surveys at chaparral at high elevations, but after our, our first fire that occurred out there, that fire burned over the ridge top and burned up most of the chaparral um, on one of the entire ridge lines at, at Bobcat. And so once that chaparral burned, it's up on this high dry ridge uh, the succession that following year is really slow. It, there's not a lot of moisture up there. It takes a while for that vegetation to come back. It was essentially non-habitat for wren tit. So wren tit love this really thick, dense, woody vegetation to, to hide in. So that was gone at the high elevations. So it may seem weird that we saw um, wren tits in burned areas because they like that dense vegetation. But the best that we um, could, could figure out is that we were getting them in burned areas low in drainages. And those burned areas low in drainages are the wettest. And so that following growing season, they were getting the most grass and the most small shrubs coming back in rapidly. And we think those wren tits were just forced down there. It was basically the only place on the landscape nearby that they could find dense vegetation. So we were getting wren tits in just really bizarre places where you would just not expect them, like hiding in thick grass down there in these drainages. And likely because their entire um, habitat patch there was burned up. Uh, if you know much about wren tits, you might also know that they are really terrible at dispersing and moving around the landscape. So they're not good at picking up and moving five miles away to another patch of chaparral. They really got to stay within a few hundred meters of, of where, they, um, where their territories are. So once that fire came through, they sort of either probably had to die if they stayed in the chaparral and there was no cover or moved down into whatever they could use. And then I've saved the most confusing for last here. I really, for three of the four of these, I have no idea why we got the association of these species in unburned areas. Um, notably, two of them, house finch and European starling, are invasive species that were more common in the burned areas. Uh, I don't know what's going on with tree swallow, which is another, another native. The only one that I think makes a bit more sense to me is, is the meadowlark there. They really do like hanging out in that thick grass with the, a lot of thatch. They nest in it, they'll still forage in it during the winter. And so I think that's just better foraging habitat for them in these, in these really dense unburned areas. But if anybody has an idea and wants to, to put it in the chat, I don't know what's going on with those other three. It just, this is just what came out as the pattern that we saw. So the other four, the two gray states and the burned, those made a lot of sense to me. I don't have any idea what's going on here. Okay. And so to wrap up, I just want to kind of take a, a step back and talk a little bit more about the big picture of this work. So I think everyone is well aware here, uh, fires are, are increasing in the West. Uh, we're, we're getting more fires, we're getting bigger fires, we're getting hotter fires, seemingly on an annual basis. And we really need to understand how they affect uh, the environment around us, how they affect the landscape, how they affect potential conservation efforts. So this is a 
an area, especially the way that fire relates to a lot of vertebrates, that we really don't have a lot of, uh, of data and a lot of knowledge. Uh, that's in part because it's hard to study. It's difficult to predict where fires are going to occur. Um, it can be difficult to get access into areas that have burned. And before and after data is tricky. It's really hard to get permission to set fires to, to do before and after. And so you've got to get lucky and have data from a site before it burns that just happens to burn afterwards, which we got really lucky here that we had some of that in, in some sites where they went from, from burn to unburn. But there's a, there's a lot of need to, to further study what's going on here. And then you might glance over the, the results that I presented at the beginning and say, wow, fire reduces species richness. It's, it's bad for birds. And I, I showed that on that first slide, that difference between the burned and unburned areas in terms of how many species were present. But I think it's, it's just a lot more complicated than that. You really have to consider what's going on, again, with the vegetation at these sites. We can't just make a value judgment here that um, these fires in these oak woodlands are, are bad for birds. And in fact, I would suggest that if you um, zoom out and you're not just looking at a single um, couple acres of land and whether it burned or not, if we zoom out to the, the whole ranch to 7,000 acres or out to the, the broader part of the coast range there, the way to maximize the number of species and the different species that are occurring on the landscape is to have a mixture of both, is to have some fire occurring on the landscape, some areas that are remaining unburned. We saw from the results that the composition of species between those burned and unburned areas were different. And so having burned and unburned areas in kind of a mosaic on the landscape might actually be the, the best way to, to manage for the most species. That is increasingly challenging though with the big fires that we're seeing that kind of are making it an all or nothing at times where they'll wipe through an entire area and really leave very little unburned habitat. And then as a reminder, we also got a, a significant difference in what birds were present between grazed and ungrazed communities, which was interesting. So there really seemed to be an effect from cattle on which birds were, were present at sites. Uh, that's despite the fact that we didn't get a difference in the number of species. So grazed and ungrazed, they're just different. We can't, there's no good, bad, we can't really make a value judgment here. They, they just contain different species. And similar to the effect of fire, if we zoom out, so we're no longer just looking at a, uh, at a single pasture and whether or not it's being grazed, if we look at the whole ranch property uh, in total, having areas that are grazed and areas that are ungrazed is going to be the way to maximize the, the number of species that occur there because they get these different communities between those two areas. And this is something that Bobcat is doing really well. The, the ranch is somewhere around 50-50 grazed and ungrazed, so there are large swaths that, that, that don't have grazing and, and areas that, that have a regular sustainable rotation of grazing. And this is a, a little bit unclear what's, what's going on here. So the, actually what's causing these changes, I uh, can almost guarantee that we don't have birds that are afraid of cows or, or birds that love cows and just want to hang out where they are. This is almost certainly a few degrees of separation removed the, what the cows are doing from how it's affecting the birds. So the, the grazing patterns from the cattle are altering the vegetation on the landscape. That may alter foraging habitat or roosting habitat for these birds, but it may also affect the insect communities that can live there and then maybe those insects are food for the birds. So still not entirely clear from these correlations what's actually going on there. And I've already mentioned this last bullet point here. So the, the last thing that I want to mention here, which I think is kind of the most important one, is potential future work from this. Where do we go from here? So at the beginning, I mentioned we had three questions. We wanted to know how fire and cattle grazing affected how many species were present, the composition of what species were there, and then the abundance, how many birds were actually there. Uh, I didn't talk about that last one. So that we've still got that in the bag to do. We have the data for it. We haven't done the analysis yet. I'm hoping that that will add another interesting wrinkle to, um, to this story once, once we finally get around to, to doing that. So we're gonna do that part for sure at some, at some point in the near future. But there's some other questions to be answered there. Uh, we don't, none of this work got at mechanisms. What's actually causing these differences? So I, I view this as very, very foundational, just looking at what are the broader patterns? What are the effects of, of cattle grazing and, and fire on the communities? What patterns do we see? There's real need to get in there and say, okay, Frank found this pattern there. What's actually going on and studying how the landscape, how fire, how changes in the vegetation are actually affecting these birds and driving these patterns. 
And then the last big one there, I, I mentioned early on that the fires that we're dealing with on uh, at Bobcat Ranch have been low, low, moderate severity, in part because of the frequent fire return interval. There's just not the ability to build up enough fuel for a bigger fire there. But as we all well know, there are other intensity fires in California. Also in Oak Woodlands, we can get more intense fires. There's no guarantee that the results that we found here will hold up for different fire intensities. We can't just assume that these same patterns hold for all fires. So there's also a need to, to repeat the same kind of work and look at how do moderate and how do severe fires affect bird communities? Because in some cases, if you get a severe fire, you get a dramatic change in the vegetation on the landscape. You do have a high degree of mortality for a lot of these dominant tree species that we didn't see at Bobcat. So that remains a, a big question to answer there. So I think uh, I, I'm happy with the science because like any good science, uh, we came in with a few questions and we finished up this project with way more questions than we started with, which I think always means that, that you did a good job. That's, that's the nature of doing science is having all these questions of well, what's going on here? What are these mechanisms? We should look at other fire intensity. So I'm hoping that we'll continue on with some other work here in, in Northern California and, and looking at some of these other questions in the near future. Okay, well, thank you all again so much for coming out and, and listening on Zoom. I know this is a, a weird format for, for coming to a talk. Um, I can take some questions in just a moment, but I have to pause and, and thank a couple folks. Uh, first of all, Chris Adlam, that's him here in this, uh, in this picture, was my, my partner in crime on all of this work. Uh, Pete collaborated with me and collected the data, helped design this study. He uh, uh, was another graduate student at University of California, Davis. Um, he's now working at, at Oregon State. Uh, he was my vegetation guy. He is much better at identifying oak trees and a lot of the other um, flora out there than I am. So none of this would have happened without, without Chris. He also took most of the landscape photos that were in this talk. Also, Dash and Audubon, California for giving me access to, to Bobcat Ranch. This is a property that is uh, protected as a reserve, not generally open to the public, but they've been great about letting researchers in there to, to look at questions like this. Emmett and Holly for, for volunteering to help collect some field data. This was a lot of data to collect over a couple winters, and so we couldn't have done it without their help. Uh, and Anne Bryce for being really enthusiastic and encouraging about this work when I first brought it to her. She's with, with Yolo Audubon and really helped facilitate getting this partnership going. So my contact info is down there in the, in the bottom left corner. Uh, again, I'm at, uh, at Humboldt State University and I can take any questions. I don't see any others in the chat, but feel free to, to put any in if you have them now. Well, thanks, Dr. Fogarty. Yeah, we did get uh, a number of questions popping up in the chat as you were going along. So I'll try and... Uh, oh, okay. Try and they may have been directly to you. They, they didn't come to me. Yeah. Most of them did, yeah. We kind of asked people to do it that way so oh, okay. kind of collect them and pass them along in case we, you know, sometimes we get three or four people with the same question. Okay, great. Um, so one question that came up pretty early on, and I think you answered this at one point, but uh, I think we'll go back to it, is uh, how big is a site? You were talking about uh, the counts at a site or a plot, but it was a little unclear what that meant. And the follow-on, well, I'll let you answer that one first. Yeah, so the individual sites where we were doing the point counts, we were collecting data on birds within 100 meters of a point, and then we did a, a vegetation protocol that characterized the vegetation within that 100 meters. So that comes out to, that's just over three hectares in size, a circular point. So that's how big they were. And we um, selected them on the landscape to make sure that they were solidly burned or not burned, and away from the edge of the fire as well. So we wanted to make sure if we had a burn site, there wasn't some unburned area just 10 feet away from it so that you'd have birds crossing over. So they were well within the boundary of the fire or well away from the boundary of the fire when we laid them out. And then my follow on question to that was exact, what's, what was the methodology for the count? How did you actually count the birds? Uh, we used uh, eight minute point counts for it. So uh, observer stands at the central point and they start a timer and they're recording all the birds that they see or hear that are within 100 meters during that eight minutes and uh, excluding flyovers as well. So like if a couple of golden eye flew over, obviously they're not gonna land in the oak savanna, those don't get counted <laughs> as well. So it's stuff using the, using the habitat. Okay, so an eight minute point count, okay. Correct, yep. Um, so 
Someone asked, uh, looking at, you were talking about the grass cover and she wondered, uh, was the difference in grass cover related to the hat, the grass itself, whether it was a perennial grass or a non-native annual grass? I, yeah, I think that's a really good question. And something that, that Chris and I talked about quite a bit was how, how fine resolution do we want to go with the, with characterizing the, the vegetation. And so we ended up going with identifying everything that was woody two species and it was just too much to do the with the amount of plots that we had to do so we ended up only counting things as being grass or forb so the short answer is we don't know um, we don't really have a great feel for we anecdotally have some ideas of where there were native grasses versus non-native grasses on the property but there's there's a lot more to, to do there if there's some kind of effect of looking at that uh, we had to do i'm trying to remember how many circle plots we had a bunch of vegetation plots within each bird point count and just estimating the grass cover alone was, was time consuming enough. I can't imagine actually doing plots to try to get it to species. We would have, I would have needed a team of 25 to do that. Yeah, yeah, that would be some seriously tedi tedious work. Yeah. Uh, so you said you do have some areas though with, uh, with perennial grass? Yeah, they've done a little bit of restoration out there in some spots and it's, it's uh, taken hold um, decently well. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I don't actually know how many of our sites overlapped with the areas that they have done the, the restoration. More of the restoration work I think has been closer to the headquarters where it's just a little bit easier to access. Uh, this is a, a really, really steep uh, place to work and so some of these areas were, were quite difficult to get into, um, challenging to get even like a, a uh, ATV and they're so steep. So those areas have seen less restoration work. So here's an interesting question uh, that you may or may not be able to answer is, uh, since this is dominantly oak woodland, will sudden oak death have an effect on this ranch and its uh, biodiversity? I, I assume that it will. I can't imagine that it would not. Um, if it becomes a major problem there. I don't think that it is a, is a huge issue on the property yet. We haven't seen a, a high degree of mortality there. If it does happen, it's going to be especially bad because there is virtually zero recruitment of blue oak and doesn't seem to have been for a few decades. So you look out there on the landscape and we didn't core the trees, but they're large. My guess is almost all those, those blue oaks are 50, 70 years old minimum that are there. And there's this huge gap in the demography because there's no recruitment, even in the ungrazed areas that haven't been grazed. So this is not all cattle grazing pressure. There's probably something else going on climate wise that is just not allowing those, those oaks to, to survive and get out of seedling stage. Part of it may be that they're also choked by invasive grasses or getting burned up in fires that are so frequently happening, but it's gonna be bad. If we start to get a lot of mortality in those mature trees, or once they start dying, they've only got a max lifespan and we don't know, maybe a lot of them are like 250, 300 years old. And if that's the case and those trees just start naturally dying, we're gonna see a major shift in the, in the landscape there. Yeah, it, I, I don't know if you mentioned, uh, you must have scrub jays there and aren't they responsible for a lot of the replanting and recruitment in, in oaks? They are surprisingly scarce for reasons I do not understand. Um, one, of the re one of the reasons we've thought about is that um, maybe they're just tied a little bit to other types of oak species around, but I don't think that's right because the blue oaks do produce enough acorns that you would think that they would use them. But um, I'd have to look at our data. I wanna say that we have something like five detections over two years of scrub jays. Wow. Yeah, and they tend to be restricted pretty much to the lower elevations uh, kind of on the valley side. For whatever reason, they're they're just not in there. Maybe they hate cows. I don't know. That is interesting because I think we had another presentation where somebody pointed out that uh, it turns out the scrub jays are responsible for most of the oak dispersal. Yeah, yeah. I would be surprised for, for dispersal. I mean, we're not even going to be seeing it around the parent trees either, just from the acorns dropping. Wow. Yeah. The audio better on everyone else's computer. It suddenly got nasty on mine. Um, well, let, we got a couple more questions. Uh, one was, uh, 
And I think you answered this one at the end, just after he asked the question about, do you need to account for fire severity? And is species diversity observation affected by the undergrowth? In other words, is it more difficult to observe the species in the denser unburned areas versus the open burned areas? Yeah, but so for the first part there, we talked a little bit about whether we needed to try to characterize the severity of these fires, and we ultimately decided that they were similar enough, the ones that we were looking at on the landscape, and just spatially similar enough that we didn't need to think about that. Did this location burn more than this location? It was more or less kind of a fast fire that just ripped through the understory, and we decided that it was, it was similar there. Certainly, if areas had experienced a really high severity fire, that's something we would have needed to think about, but maybe lucky for us, the fire was, was relatively homogenous on, on this landscape, um, as far as fire can be, for the two years that we were working there. Uh, and then the other question was, oh, the understory. No, I don't think so in most cases. Uh, so part of what we were doing when we were laying these sites out is we have a, we knew that the site was going to be laid out at a given spot, just from the, the randomization of the distance, we're going to put these at point slightly just to make sure that it wasn't like put like 203 feet, couldn't see anything. We'd move the, the point over 10 feet where the observer was standing, just so that there'd be a clear view. And the, the understory under areas never usually gets that extensive out there. I would almost say topography would be a bigger issue in some cases than um, than in terms of visibility. That being said, the vast majority of our detections are auditory. I think probably somewhere around 70, 80 percent. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah, if you're doing ear bring, it doesn't really matter how dense the cover is. Yeah. Uh, finally, uh, I think this might be the last of the chat questions, and then I have a couple more, I think. Um, do you have a sense of how uh, nearby larger fires might have affected your study. Uh, you, you alluded to the possibility of wren tits moving around looking for new habitat. Uh, is, do you think that might, do you have any evidence, I guess, that there's a, that kind of effect from larger fires pushing birds around? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, are you able to hear me okay, Tim? I got a message that the, the audio is getting a little fuzzy. Yeah, it's uh, pretty crackly on my computer. I wasn't sure if it was my machine or okay. on your end. Uh, I guess it must be. Do you offer a moment? Sometimes that helps. Does that get any better? No, it's still. Still. Okay. Yeah. Well, my best to, to talk slow and hopefully it'll, it'll get better. It must just be my, my internet. Um, yeah, that's an interesting, an interesting question there. So, He's doing the work out there. There wasn't a even nearby you're, fire. You're, wasn't, wasn't you're getting almost impossible to understand. Your audio is uh, kind of cutting out. Maybe try muting it and restarting your audio or something because it's uh, we're losing a lot of it. How's that? Any better? Huh? No. On my end, anyway, it's still. Uh, it sounds like you got a. You're talking while someone is crushing rocks. Um, my screen share, no, no better now. Doesn't seem to be. <laughs> Mr. Roboto, yeah, it, yeah. It's just quick rejoin the meeting and maybe that'll help. Getting really uh, digitized. All right, I'll be back in just a sec. I'll just leave the meeting and move on. Maybe okay. Yeah, I think that's probably the best idea. So in the meantime, if you have any more questions that you'd like Dr. Fogarty to answer, go ahead and fire away on the chat. Uh, this is a, a pretty good, lively discussion. We're getting some good questions here. I think one thing that uh, it really caught my eye was that bit about the, the weird species that show up in the unburned areas. and and. Not All right, how about now? Relation to that. Now that sounds much better. Awesome, okay. Well, somehow that did the trick. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, nearby fire could could certainly have an impact like with, with the rent hits or something like that with moving birds around. I don't think that we were actually working in a given year where that could really be something that we measured because 
there, the nearby fire was the fire that was happening on, that happened on the, the Bobcat property there. Also, I think the rent tits are a unique case there in that they're really poor dispersers and they're also using a, a land cover type that's scarce. When we're doing this work, we're a few months removed from the fires. So the fires are happening in June, July, August. We're doing this work from like late November through the very beginning of March. So there's a lot of time for birds to move around. In fact, a lot of, uh, many of the species that are migratory that we have there are coming from somewhere else. They weren't even present there during, during the summer. So it'd be interesting to see. Yeah, and certainly I would imagine closer to the fire actually occurring, you might see an effect there. My sense is that the species might be able to reshuffle around a little bit after the fire if there was something to go back to. But yeah, just a anecdotal there. I don't really know. Well, the, the rent hit observation was really interesting to me because as when I read about the fires, you know, in especially in Mendocino County and adjoining counties, they're largely in chaparral type habitat. And, you know, the rent hit density is phenomenal. And I just, that's the first thing I think of every time I hear of one of these fires is what about the poor little wren tits? Because they just can't fly well enough to outrun. Yeah. And the, the mortality must be really high in those birds. That's, yeah, that's my guess, is that they're probably one of the species that's impacted the most. And I would be surprised if their survival was great, even where we were getting them to. It's just such poor rent, even where we had them displaced down into those drainages. Right. I'm, I'm guessing that they were struggling down there with, higher levels of predation and also with finding food because it's such unusual foraging for them. Yeah, yeah, well, it's a tough life. Um, and then what I'm hoping is that there's someone somewhere doing some research on the recolonization rates. I am really curious as to how, you know, what is the rate at which wren tits recolonize a large burned area? And yeah. The extent that they get I don't know if they get extirpated or, you know, if they find some little unburned refuges in the middle and then they can recolonize them there. You know, there's just a lot of un, unanswered questions. Yeah. And certainly if those patches are isolated, it can take a long time. Uh, we, the a great example that I often talk about with my students here in Arcata is the Arcata Marsh, which is just, I don't know, a straight line distance, maybe a mile and a half, a mile from rented habitat where there are rented around and they got extirpated from the marsh probably for, for a variety of reasons, feral cats, change of what was going on there. And it took them decades to recolonize from a mile away or so. It's only in the last few years that they've, they've managed to get there again. So, I mean, they had to cross over 101. I think that was a big barrier. Just yeah. 101 and some pasture land and, and part of downtown Arcata, getting that one mile is just really tough that for a bird that's a really poor disperser, yeah. Yeah, flying across Highway 101, is, I mean, that's like an epic journey for a wren tit. That's, yeah. They, they, they'd have to fuel up. Uh, well, I think that's basically, uh, that's most of what I have. The, the one question I, I do have is, um, is there a citizen science opportunity here? Have, is there any uh, thought given to how to get, marshal more resources and gather more data? Yeah. I, it'd be cool, I mean, to, to do something that way. I'm, I'm hoping to get something going somewhere up this way. I think I'm, I'm probably done working on, on Bobcat for now, even though it keeps perpetually burning, but hoping <laughs> to start looking into that um, a bit further north. And so um, stay tuned, I guess, <laughs> for that. Hopefully we'll, we'll have something going in the, in the next couple of years, starting to look at some of the, some other questions related to fire here in Northern California. All right, one more question just popped up and uh, this, I think you, Kind of alluded to this, but maybe this is a great way to conclude. Uh, can you generalize whether moderate fire is good or bad, or is grazing good or bad for species diversity? Uh, both. <laughs> I think would be my, my answer there. I think I'll come back to that question of it doesn't seem like either of these, at least in this system, and I will say that as a as a, a huge caveat there. If you go to a different system, go to a different landscape you could end up with places where fire is really bad or cattle grazing is really bad. But at least in this system that we're looking at, oak woodland in, in the foothills of, of Northern California around the Sacramento Valley, it seems like it's just different. And that it, maintaining some mosaic of those two things, at least in our study area, 
seem to be the way to, to maximize the most species that were present. And that, that goes for, as I said, for both fire and for cattle grazing. So I know it's not a very satisfying answer. We want to be able to say, we got to stop the cattle grazing or we got to do more cattle grazing to, to fix things. But as usual, nature's complicated and it's, there's not really yeah. a black and white answer. Yeah, a lot of these habitats don't have a, you know, the equilibrium is dynamic. It, it's, its normal state is changing from mm -hmm. kind of association to another. All right, I don't see any other questions popping up. I think we've had a great, uh, that was a great presentation and, and it sounded like a lot of work. <laughs> it was. I know exactly what you're talking about when you say how steep that country is. You mentioned that several times and uh, yeah. boy, it, <laughs> it leaves a mark in the mind after you climb those hill, hills a few times. Yep. Uh, you're, especially if you did it in the summertime. <laughs> All right, well, great presentation. Thanks very much, Dr. Fogarty, for joining us tonight, and uh, very well done. Great, thank you all for coming. And thanks again to Nikki for running the meeting and getting a recording. And I uh, should also mention that this, uh, we will get this recording of this presentation onto our new YouTube channel. Uh, there will be links to it on our website, that's mendocinocoastaudubon.org. And our YouTube channel has uh, the last couple of presentations on it already. And uh, David and I are working on getting some more short form videos up to help you with your winter birding. And we'll talk more about that next month. Uh, but that's where this will show up and we'll get a link on our website so you can forward that to any of your friends who you think might uh, appreciate seeing this presentation and you can also of course review it at any time and with that i think we're done here thanks everyone <laughs>